Imagine cutting a 13-hour flight down to just three and a half, soaring at twice the speed of sound, sipping champagne at the edge of space. It was supposed to be the future of travel. Instead, it became one of aviation's biggest failures. This is the rise and fall of Concorde, and why you could never afford to fly it. Hello friends. In the 1950s, a flight from London to New York was a grueling 13 hours. All the while enduring the noise and vibration of piston engines and that occasional white-knuckle ride through a North Atlantic storm. And then, along came jetliners. They flew above the weather, and a flight from London to New York was cut to just seven hours. The jet age revolutionized air travel. But an even bigger leap forward was just around the corner. In the upcoming supersonic age, airliners would travel twice the speed of sound and fly right at the edge of space. Cutting a trip from London to New York down to just three and a half hours. It was supposed to be the next giant leap forward. But instead, going supersonic would end up as one of biggest missteps in commercial history. In 1947, a rocket-powered plane breaks through the sound barrier. The first time in history an aircraft is recorded flying faster than the speed of sound. The monumental achievement puts to rest doubts about whether man or machine could even withstand supersonic flight. And it was just the start. New speed records quickly followed as supersonic flight became widely understood. And it wasn't long before military aircraft were routinely flying well beyond the sound barrier. If a commercial airliner could be built to do the same, a trip across the Atlantic could be cut down to just a couple hours, pulling the world closer together. But flying at supersonic speeds requires engines at least twice as powerful as those on subsonic jets. Streamlined wings and airframes, and materials that can withstand the high temperatures caused by air friction. With these technical hurdles, there were doubts about whether supersonic air travel made any sense. But only a decade earlier, there was similar skepticism around the switch from props to jets. Even so, the transition to jet age happened quickly and it left many aircraft builders behind. The upcoming supersonic age could end up doing the same. In 1949, the British stunned the world with the first jet airliner. It flew faster and higher than any airliner before it. The Comet was revolutionary, and with it, the British were going to lead the world into the jet age. That is, until a design flaw caused a string of deadly accidents, temporarily grounding the comet, which gave the rest of the world time to catch up. By 1960, for every comet sold, the Americans were selling another 10 jetliners of their own, and the British quickly lost their early lead in the jet age. But if supersonic air travel was the next evolution, Britain would have another chance to retake the lead. By 1961, the British had come up with an early design for a supersonic airliner. At the same, the French were also working on a similar concept. As both efforts advanced, it made sense to join forces. And after a little creative deal-making and political maneuvering, the two countries partnered to launch the Concorde program, signing a treaty in 1962. Britain and France, once fierce aircraft-building rivals would now work together to reinvent air travel. Thousands of the brightest French and British engineers were put to work making supersonic air travel a reality. Aside from maybe the Apollo moon landings, Concorde was the most technically ambitious project of the century. It would cruise at twice the speed of sound, with enough range to fly across the Atlantic. Although it would burn more fuel, Concorde would make two flights in the same time a regular jet could make just one. Offsetting higher fuel costs by reducing the number of aircraft needed for each route. By 1963, mock-ups were capturing the world's imagination and dazzling the press. And airlines placed orders for more than 70 Concorde. A number expected to grow to at least 200 by 1975. And beneath Concorde's elegant lines was triumph of engineering. Its delta wing took over 5,000 hours of wind tunnel testing to perfect. An ingenious shape that allowed Concorde to fly beyond Mach 2, but also slow enough to fly into existing airports. After burning turbojets were sourced from a Cold War era bomber. But they were re-engineered with an innovative intake system that allowed for crews at supersonic speeds for longer than aircraft in history. With a streamlined airframe, Concorde's sleek nose obscured the pilot's view. The solution was a nose cone that lowered to provide better visibility during takeoff and landing. The sheer number of innovations was astounding. But by 1967 Concorde was ready to be unveiled to the public. As Concorde landed, dozens of people telephoned the airport to complain about the noise. For those who live near the runways at Kennedy Airport claim it's just the noise plane in the world. 002 didn't help with matters when it left with the loudest takeoff ever recorded at Tokyo Airport. This magnificent machine is a prime producer of a sound that nobody wants. The sonic boom. So far, 7,000 people have complained. 
The National Science Foundation of the United States government has indicated that there will be severe environmental damage to the ozone layer. In fact, they say the plane is all wrong. Too dare, too small, too dirty, and too noisy. Your biggest customers have, have gone down the drain. No, they haven't gone down the drain, they've. The Concorde has always seemed to me to be part of particularly French patriotism. If you kill it, what do you put in its place? I do not kill it. Never lived. For Concorde from the beginning. By the early 1970s, Concorde was facing a perfect storm. There were even doubts about whether the plane would make it into service. For one, Concorde's afterburning turbojets were twice as loud on takeoff compared to jetliners of the day and it led to protests around the world. And like all supersonic aircraft, Concorde generated sonic booms. Loud bangs heard by anyone under the supersonic flight path. Public tolerance for sonic booms had clearly been underestimated because one by one, countries started banning supersonic flights over their airspace. Evidence was also mounting that Concorde could damage the environment. If hundreds entered into service, regular high-altitude supersonic flights could destroy the ozone layer. But the biggest challenge facing the program was economics. Concorde had been designed in the 1960s, when jet fuel was just pennies per gallon. But it would enter commercial service in the mid to late 1970s, just as the price of oil began to skyrocket. And Concorde burned nearly four times more fuel than even a first-generation jetliner, while carrying fewer passengers. The economics made no sense. And by the end of 1973 nearly every airline cancelled their options. Leaving just a tiny handful of orders. Nowhere near the 150 planes needed the program to sell just to break even. All the while, development costs were spiraling out of control. To more than 10 times the original estimate by the early 1970s. But with the Concorde Treaty, neither France nor Britain could back out of the program without paying the other massive penalties. So with or without orders, the Concorde program would have to push forward. After 14 years of development, Concorde was finally ready to enter service. And on January 21, 1976, two Concords simultaneously lifted off carrying their first passengers. It was a huge milestone for the program, but hardly the bold new era of mass supersonic air travel that many had once predicted. Because British Airways and Air France were the only airlines to put Concorde into service. And both nationally owned airlines had been more or less been forced to. Each taking delivery of just a few planes. With limited range and overland flight restrictions, there were few route options available. Every time Concorde takes off, British Airways loses money, if it's half empty as it is on the Bahrain route, it's costing them up to £20,000 a flight. In just the first few years, British Airways and Air France lost tens of millions operating Concords. And by 1980 rumors were swirling that planes would be retired early. It might seem a strange decision to have the government subsidizing one of the most expensive forms of transport in the world. But a dramatic turnaround was just around the corner. By the mid-1980s, British Airways and Air. France were not only still operating their Concords, they had figured out how to make huge profits with them. With the prospect of supersonic air travel for the masses having come and gone, and with only 14 Concords in service, the plane was transformed into more than just faster air travel. Instead, Concorde was rebranded into an ultra-exclusive travel experience. Aimed at a new kind of passenger with much deeper pockets. By the mid-1980s, the price of Concorde tickets had doubled from they were in the 1970s. At one point costing upwards of 20000 in today's dollars for a London to New York round trip. Concorde might have failed to revolutionize air travel, but it also opened up a profitable new market serving celebrities and the ultra-rich. And with only a handful of aircraft in service, public concern over the environment and noise faded. Instead for nearly three decades, Concorde served as a symbol of pride for the British and French. But much like its development and introduction, Concorde's final years would prove difficult. A tragic crash in July 2000, caused by a piece of runway debris, tarnished Concorde's impeccable safety record. A year later the events of September the 11th led to a huge decline in air travel. And then there were the challenges of maintaining such complex and aging planes. In 2003, after 27 years of service, the most recognizable and iconic aircraft in history was retired by Air France and British Airways closing the final chapter on the most ambitious aviation project of the century. Concorde may be gone, but its legacy still fascinates aviation lovers around the world. If you enjoyed this deep dive into its story, make sure to hit that like button, share it with others, and subscribe for more incredible stories from aviation history. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.